Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, this is my first York Circle uh, experience. So some of you, I'm sure, have come to other talks, and so this is a nice, uh, uh, a nice opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the challenge of. Uh, of reconciling conservation with development. This is one of the big issues of, of our day. Um, you know, there's vital, vital questions regarding biodiversity extinctions, uh, great economic inequities, uh, climate change. As some of you know, there's a, a, a huge march in New York tomorrow against uh, or to express concern about climate change. So there's, these are big, big questions that, that are uh, with us today and we're looking for solutions and something needs to be done. And so I will tell you a story of attempts at, at uh, reconciling conservation and development in one little corner of, of the planet. And um, it's, uh, it's the story of, of the Las Novas project. <clears throat> so two years ago, I, was, um, a, I had the great fortune of being hired as the director of the Las Novas project here at the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. Um, so this was a, a dream job, really. It, it brought together so many things that, that were important to me. One was that it allowed me to address the issues of reconciling conservation and development uh, as a central part of my job. Uh, another really important thing was that uh, the Faculty of Environmental Studies is, is, uh, is committed to an uh, interdisciplinary focus. And this is something that I think is very important for environmental problems and development problems that are complex issues. And the third thing was that it allowed me to work in my home country, in Costa Rica, uh, in part of the country that is one of my favorite. And in fact, I even had a little piece of land in this area. So it was, I was able to come to Toronto and to one of the biggest cities of North America and yet maintain my links with my home country in Costa Rica. In 1998, uh, Woody Fisher, a physician from Toronto, uh, bought 120 hectares of land in in the rainforests in, in Costa Rica. He's, uh, he was a, uh, or he is a man who is passionate about a conservation. And on one of his trips to Costa Rica, he, he realized that there was a land to, to be bought and protected. And he had a friendship with a professor at the Faculty of Environmental Studies, a Howard Dougherty. And in their conversations, uh, they agreed to, or Woody Fisher agreed to donate 120 or so hectares of rainforest to the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And this became the backbone of the Las Nubes project. <clears throat> what you see here is the dream job uh, slide because uh, it's also, it was like a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, no? And um, so that is actually the, the, one of the valleys in the southern part of Costa Rica where the Las Nubes project is, is located. And this is the Las Nubes forest reserve that belongs to the Faculty of Environmental Studies of York University. And it's yeah, 130 hectares of primary rainforest and the, the spirit of donating this to FES was to promote conservation. 
So in 2004, the biological corridor, the Alexander Scutch biological corridor was created. And so the little purple section here is the, the, um, the land Woody Fisher donated, the Las Nubes Forest. And it is touching one of the largest protected areas of all of Central America. This is the Chiripo National Park, and that forms part of the La Amistad Bi National Park. And this is a park, a protected area that, uh, that is in Panama and Costa Rica, and in Central America, it's the largest, uh, the largest extension of protected land. So what we have here is a biological corridor that extends the habitat and the ecosystems of this area uh, further on down, linking it to another patch of forest, which is the Alexander Scutch uh, Bird Sanctuary or the Alexander Scutch Farm. Alexander Scutch was a ornithologist who in the 1930s went to this area in Costa Rica and made his homestead in a, in a forest. And he lived there until he was 100 years old, uh, short a few days of, of being 100 years old. Um, he spent all his time in the forest. He lived in a humble home uh, with no electricity, no running water, he and his wife. And um, he wrote over 40 books and hundreds of articles on birds and, uh, and what, he, what he observed in, in, in the environment. So he wrote the definitive book, or he's an authority on the birds of Costa Rica. Um, plus he wrote philosophy books, he wrote novels, and all of that in his uh, humble home in, inside a forest. Nowadays, this patch, his farm, is one of the few patches of forest that remain. Since the 1940s to this day, much of this has been deforested. This other piece of forest that belongs to York is another patch of forest. A biological corridor is an agreement among people to create connectivity between different patches of, of, of forest. So what we have here is not that this is already forested area, but it's an area where the seven communities that live here, some 2,000 people, have agreed to attempt to connect these areas with uh, increased tree cover by reforesting, by planting uh, shade trees in the coffee farms, um, allowing trees to grow along the, along the riparian area, the rivers here, and to engage in sustainable practices that will allow them to coexist with the environment. So this is one initiative but in Costa Rica, there are many such initiatives, which is an exciting thing as well. Uh, this is Costa Rica. To the north, we have Nicaragua. To the south, we have Panama. And this right here is our little biological corridor. As you can see, it links. We don't see the part in Panama, but these blue areas are national parks. So the blue uh, national parks, La Amistad, uh, protected area is being extended, the habitat is being extended through our biological corridor. And eventually the idea is to link it to the coastal areas along the, the river uh, ecosystems. And the importance of a biological corridor is that it allows species to move up and down where they can uh, increase their habitat, increase their territory, and also find other members of their of, of their own species um, so that there's no uh, potential loss of, of species by inbreeding. Um, and some species need lowlands to, um, to find specific foods during certain times of the year or part of their life cycle uh, occurs in, in different ecosystems. So a corridor allows for that to happen. <coughs> So this is a little bit of the background of, of where the Las Noes project is. 
I wanted to put this in writing so that it could be clearly stated. So the mission of the Lasnovis project is to contribute to livelihood options and community well-being in ways that promote environmental conservation. Uh, the wording of that is important because our, our focus is, our focus are the people and the well-being of the people and looking for ways that people can live in the environment in such a way that the environment is protected. We're not interested uh, in, in uh, fencing off a piece of land and to protect that wh while the local peasants don't have a livelihood. So our focus is to look at how people can improve their livelihoods in ways that are harmonious with, with environmental conservation. Because in the tropics and in Costa Rica in particular, and here especially, the environment is inhabited by people. It's not, it's not pristine without human, uh, without human habitation. People live there and people form part of the environment. Um, and so that is part of the, the challenge that we have of reconciling human uh, livelihoods, uh, development, and conservation. And as I mentioned before, the FES um, approach is interdisciplinary. So our strategy is to integrate a research, environmental education, and community engagement. Sometimes it's difficult to separate these because they're all interlinked, and research at one point can be environment, uh, community engagement, and education can lead to research. But I've tried to s segregate these in, in little uh, sections to make it easier to understand. So the people in the corridor are mostly uh, small, uh, small farmers, peasant farmers. Uh, most of them grow coffee. And um, as many of you know, uh, peasant farmers and small farmers are uh, throughout the world uh, seeing their livelihoods become more and more precarious. It's difficult to be a small farmer, to be a peasant. Um, yet the, the people there uh, love their life. They want to be peasants. They want to continue uh, growing uh, coffee. They love growing coffee. Um, but sometimes it's very difficult to make a living. Uh, only last year, the whole region was devastated by a roya uh, fungus. That's a rust that makes all the leaves of the, of the coffee plants fall, fall down or wither and wilt and um, there's zero production of coffee. But, um, so these people, even with those kinds of problems, they are rooted to the land, they want to stay, and they need options of how to, uh, how to bear these difficult years so that uh, when the coffee production is good, they can, they can maintain their, their production. And the challenges that they face are challenges that people are facing throughout the world. So it's, this experience is, um, I think it's, it can talk to, um, to people in many different places of the world. One, one option that, I mean the final option that many of these small farmers have is to abdicate, sell their land and move away and go to the cities. Uh, well, that's not what we want, and it's not what they want. Um, another option is to intensify their, their, their activities, work more, try to find other, other jobs as well, uh, or do with, with less, um, not send the children to, to school. Um, so the other option is for them to diversify their activities. And what are some, some of the options that they have? Well, when coffee doesn't work, they grow sugar cane. And they also mix it with, uh, with a little bit of cattle. Um, uh, reforesting little patches of, of forest for lumber, but that's a, a longer term uh, strategy, which is what we see here. Uh, one option which many of the people in the community are, are looking for, or looking at, as a good possibility is small-scale 
uh, ecotourism. And this is something that uh, we'll look at soon. Um, ecotourism is an option that they see is complementary to their farming. We'll look at that a little bit in more detail. Um, so that is the, the community, the people. I said there was 20, no, 2,000 people, more or less. The biological corridor is 6,000 uh, square hectares, some, what, 15,000 acres, more or less. So it's a small area, um, but we think that if we can achieve this uh, reconciliation or this harmonious uh, a relationship between conservation and development or well-being in this little area, it can serve as an example for other areas. So as I said before, one of our strategies or one, one of the prongs of our strategy is research. So one of our, one of our interesting projects is a mammal monitoring a project. And we've set up cameras in the corridor that uh, shoot off automatically when an animal passes by. And uh, oftentimes, a lot of the, the fauna in this region is nocturnal. And so we humans are mostly diurnal, and uh, we go to sleep at night, and we don't see everything that's happening there. But there's uh, many neighbors that, we've, that we generally just uh, are not aware of. This is one of them, the puma. So this is. In, in, not in the forest, up uh, in the Las Nuevas forest, but in the corridor area next to the river in someone's farm. So these are animals that have already been able to uh, find or extend their territory into the corridor. This is another one. Uh, it's a type of ocelot. Um, and the important thing of this is that many of the people in the, in the corridor don't or haven't seen these animals. They don't see them. They haven't seen them. And when the research that we do, uh, we, we, we share that with the community, they're also amazed. And they become that much more invested in conserving the, the corridor. So this research uh, spills into community action once we we share these, these activities. And the, the people in the community, some of them uh, are the ones that actually put up the cameras, take out the, the, the photographs, and put them on, on internet and Dropbox and send them to us. So there's a, a, there's a, a process of, of training in the community as well, uh, creating capacities. Another project that we have is the bird monitoring project. And um, as I mentioned before, this area is uh, named after Alexander Scutch. And he's our bird guy, our, our guru. And um, for good reason, because there's about, there's over 300 bird species in the corridor. And um, we've had a, a, a project of monitoring the bird species there. Uh, we're, we're now in the, in the process of writing a bird guide for the, for the Alexander Scutch Corridor. Part of the, of the reason for this is to uh, put it on the map as a birding uh, destination. And it's also, uh, the idea is for the local community to see the potential of birds uh, as a source of income as well, if they have, if they receive tourists to 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 look at and to you know spot the birds, the the people in the community receive people in their homes. They have homestays, and so part of their income could be uh, complemented by this. So the bird guide is made up of uh, simple information. Um, and it's in English and in Spanish, so that the local community can use it as a training, um, as a training tool, and they become a bird, bird, a bird guides for people that might come and visit them. Uh, some of the birds are actually migrant birds. Uh, some 
are dual citizens. They live in Costa Rica and they come to Canada. Um, so they have this, this uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they travel back and forth. It's sometimes uh, here in Canada, they think, oh, well, they, they migrate south. But down there we say, no, they migrate north. So, <laughs> so I, I prefer to consider them as dual citizens. This one here obviously is not a dual citizen, right? We don't see him or her in, in, in Toronto. But there are uh, birds that, that, that move back and forth. And that adds to the, to, the, to the picture of the links that exist between, between York and the corridor in Costa Rica. It's just, it shows how uh, living beings don't, don't respect borders. Uh, and we're all connected, you know, so that's important. Um, another project that we have is what is called the Virtual Corridor. This is a database that we're creating online, on internet, where a different, uh, so the, the idea is that this is a user-friendly database where the local people can go in and access all the information of our research there. And it's also a place where they can put up information, uh, say, if they have a, 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 a tourist attraction that they want to offer, they can put it up there. So it becomes um, a site of knowledge creation, access to knowledge, and information exchange. This is, we're in the process of, of developing this, and we've tested it, a, some, we've already tested it a few times in the corridor, and part of this process ends up being a, a training a opportunity. So some of the people in the corridor really don't, I mean, the, the times we've met with some, some women in the corridor, a, they had never a, even held a mouse. And so this was an experience for them. And they're very excited about learning about how to use computers, and uh, this, this is a, an opportunity. Part of our research, and a very important part of our research, is a graduate student research. So here I listed just a number of, of current uh, projects that are, that are ongoing with uh, graduate students. Uh, we have Peasant Identity and a Sense of Place and Rootedness. This is a PhD student uh, looking at uh, how the peasants uh, are rooted to the land, the reasons for this, and how they see themselves as peasants. Then we have another uh, project, Peasant Contradictions Between Production and Conservation, where the campesinos or the small farmers recognize the, the things that they do that are uh, um, deleterious to the environment, but they find that they have no other option. So they have an environmental awareness but they are forced to put a, a insecticides and herbicides. Uh, they're forced to burn their garbage. They're forced to do these things that um, they recognize are not coherent with the idea of this um, biological corridor. And this is you know, something that we can all probably relate to. We know that it's a, not the best thing to drive our cars and to burn fossil fuels, but it's difficult to find alternatives. And so these questions at the local level uh, are questions that we can all um, relate to. There's also other projects, uh, options for rural community tourism. Uh, I have a student who's looking at, is doing Estudio um, Factibilidad, uh, uh, what is it called in English? Um, a study to see if it's feasible, a feasibility study for the tourism in the corridor. And another student looking at ethnobotany and food security. I had a student that looked at the aquatic biodiversity in the, in the corridors, because we have mammals, we have birds, but there's very little in terms of the river, uh, the river species. Um, 
And just going here to the last one, environmental impact uh, of hydroelectric plants. So a lot, a lot of the research of our students is uh, generated by the interests and the needs of the local community. Um, as I'll show you a little bit further on down, hydroelectric, the plans for building hydroelectric dams on these rivers uh, and in the corridor has generated a, a movement to protect the rivers. And one of my students uh, did, a did an analysis of the environmental impact of possible dams being, being built there. And this has served the local movement to have good arguments to, um, to defend their, their, their position. So all of this research, again, moves into the area of, uh, of community engagement as well. The other area that we um, segregate is environmental education. So every year there's a... a, a a summer field course in Costa Rica. And this course looks at the different options of sustainability or different uh, attempts at sustainable development in, in Costa Rica. And we look at, at, at sustainable options at different scales, at the family level, at the co-op level, at the community level, at the national level. So there's different a, different systems and different um, initiatives of conservation and improving community well-being. And when the students go there, we, we do homestays. So the students stay with the families in the community. And this allows or contributes to the to the local livelihood of the people. So they are able to see the links between environmental conservation research and improving their livelihoods. Uh, so we stay in their homes, we pay them rent, and we, we, we pay them for room and board. And in some cases, this, uh, this additional income is actually the only income they have received because of the coffee situation that they've been suffering. So there's a, there's a mutual interest there, but it's not, the relationship is by no means simply an economic relationship. When the students go there, they create these bonds, uh, effective bonds that last for many years in many cases. And it's actually kind of amazing that after being there for such a short period, really three weeks is, is not much, um, when the students leave, there's tears and it's like family and going away. And, and, and a lot of the, uh, of the students that do go to the course end up doing research there, long-term research. So again, environmental education then spills into the research area, which then has impacts with the local community. And we visit farms and there's many modes of transportation, as you can see here. Um, and the, the, the course also takes a watershed approach. We start at the highlands of the, uh, in, the, in the cloud forests, and then we continue going, going downstream uh, into the lowland forests. Um, at some point, we end up uh, at the mangroves at the bottom of the, of the river where the, where the fresh water meets the salt water. And the mangrove areas are an important, uh, an important ecosystem where uh, the life cycle of many fish species occur there and then they migrate up the rivers. And so it's also, it shows the connection between uh, what happens at the lower ends of the, of the watershed are, have an impact and vice versa on the upper areas of the watershed. And finally, we end up on the coast. And yes, they have a bit of fun there as well. But um, of course, fisheries and the, the ecosystems, uh, the aquatic 
and marine ecosystems are also impacted by what happens up in the corridor. Pesticides that are used in the, in the, for, in the coffee plantations, etc., have an impact here. <coughs> So uh, the last uh, section of our multi-pronged uh, strategy is community engagement and outreach. So many, um, maybe some of you have, uh, have come across the Las Nubes coffee. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Anyway, this is a coffee that's sold at York and in Timothy's uh, shops throughout uh, Ontario. This was a a, a project that was developed by my predecessor and the professor who started the Las Nubes project, uh, Howard Dougherty. Um, and this was linking the production of coffee in the corridor with uh, the retail market here in, in, in Ontario. And one of the interesting uh, things of this, of this uh, agreement is that for every pound of Las Nubes coffee sold, Timothy's would donate one dollar to the Las Nubes project, which then goes back to education, research, and community engagement. So that's a nice way of, of reconciling, linking these, these two worlds and contributing to, to well-being. Uh, other forms of community engagement that, that we've done uh, is to promote spaces of exchange. Last year, no, two years ago, we started a, the Alexander Scotch Festival. And this, is a, this was conceived of as a, like a, a trade fair or uh, a place where all of the products of the corridor could be exhibited and the people in the corridor could see all of the production, cultural, agricultural, uh, research, uh, institutional, everything that was going on in the corridor could be showcased in this, in this festival. Um, so the idea was to generate a sense of belonging to the corridor, because not everyone in the corridor recognizes that they are in this corridor. Um, but, so it's an environmental education opportunity as well. And here we had Canadian students and the local community coming together and being able to discuss many of the issues that were important to them. This last year, the organization of this festival now is in hands of the local community. So they appropriated it, and a group of, of, uh, of young women in the corridor took it upon themselves to organize it, to make contact with all of the different uh, artisans, uh, farmers, uh, organizations, and bring them together. So once again, it's strengthening the networks and the possibilities of, of uh, working together. Here's an example of environmental education during the festival. And the cultural production. So it was a showcase of everything that's, that this small corridor produces. And it produces more than just coffee. And it produces more than, than research. It produces uh, art and uh, um, cultural expressions. So part of our work is to explore uh, livelihoods with the people. And so we, we, have, um, we constantly are meeting with community organizations about options that they are looking for uh, or looking, looking at, um, how to add value to their products, uh, how to link their products uh, as, as producers with buyers here in, in, in Canada. Um, as I mentioned before, ecotourism is one of, the, one of the options that they're looking at as a great possibility. And so there's, uh, there's trails through the forest, there's walks through the farms, uh, swimming in the rivers. Uh, there's many different things, looking at birds, looking at animals, looking at uh, ancient uh, ar archaeological petroglyphs uh, that are scattered throughout the region as well. And so some people have developed uh, little swimming pools and, and places where people can go and, and, and stay and, and spend some time. So it kind of looks like paradise, no? 
Um, and it's, it's just a beautiful, a beautiful place. If you see in the background there, that's, that's the Las Nubes forest. So this is a, uh, a local farmer who has developed a little, a little tourist attraction on their land and it's linked to this wouldn't, this wouldn't be a specially interesting tourist attraction if it weren't for the fact that it, 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 it is part of a biological corridor and it does contribute to the protection of, of the species that we saw in the other slides. If this were a completely isolated from a biological corridor, it would be less attractive. If the Las Nubes coffee were just coffee produced in some other a, area without a link to conservation, it wouldn't be, sure, it's good coffee, but it's not, it, that's not the primary reason to consume that coffee. We promote the coffee because it contributes to the livelihoods of people in this place where they're committed to preserving the corridor. So there's trails, there's vines, all sorts of things. Uh, can you see that? This tree here, this is one of my uh, fun ones to talk about. It actually walks through the forest um, very slowly. But, um, but where, where the sunlight hits, the, these adventitious roots start growing. So the roots grow towards the sunlight. And where there's shade, those roots start dying off. So if you do a slow motion or a fast motion type of photography, these trees are walking through the forest trying to get, get sunbathed, you know. Um, and yes, for them, we probably are running around super fast like little ants, but they're walking, so uh, there's many interesting things there. Um, we also contribute, as I mentioned before, with uh, local movements. Um, this, is, this is a march that the local community had to protect the rivers from hydroelectric dams that are being planned on, on, their, on their rivers. Uh, people have signs that say no to the hydroelectric dams, yes to free rivers. Um, so one of our small research projects is to look at the stories that rivers uh, tell through the people in the community. And the idea is to show how the river is actually a member of the community. It's not a commodity. It's not just a flow of transparent liquid. It forms part of the life of the people and it has moods. It is friendly. It is ferocious. Um, it forms part of their memories of childhood, of a lot of uh, family outings. And so, when the, and, and the idea is that these narratives and these stories are important to the people and they should be considered um, that it is not just a matter of how much money it can make or how much electricity it can generate. Another thing that we do are strengthening networks, not only within the community, in the corridor, but uh, internationally. So we brought the, the Minister of Culture of Costa Rica, and he met with uh, different uh, people here in, in Toronto. Um, we have memorandums of understanding with the University of Costa Rica, with the Tropical Science Center, uh, the Technological University. These are the largest um, public universities of Costa Rica. And it's important to bring together researchers and students with, uh, together to, to the communities and be able to converse with the local farmers to um, collaborate. And in this spirit, we are currently working to build the Lillian Megan Wright Center. So this is actually a fake picture, right? You can tell. But um, this is one of the latest renditions of this center that the Faculty of Environmental Studies is planning to build in the corridor just across the, the, the forest, the Woody Fisher donated forest. And the idea of this space is that it becomes 
a space for environmental education, for research, and for community uh, engagement. Uh, my hope is that this will become a place where the local people will want to go and uh, use for a wedding or for whatever. Um, but also, the idea is that uh, we have scientific uh, symposia, uh, uh, events happening here, and bring researchers to the, to the corridor, uh, bring concerts, bring um, writers in residence. Uh, so to invigorate uh, the, the corridor with many more activities that the people there are hungry for. The young people in the corridor often say that there's nothing to do there. And so they prefer to go to San Jose, the capital city, and, and leave the corridor. But uh, the hope here, and this is in consultation with the community, and they're, they're happy with this, with this project, that uh, it will bring in more things to the community and will bring also employment opportunities and generate more tourism possibly in the corridor that will help them improve their livelihoods that are connected to conservation. So this is a project that we're excited about. Um, right now I'm in a back and forth with, uh, with the architect and it should be up and running within a year. So what are we now? Yeah, within a year it should be a reality. And um, this is something that hopefully all of you will consider going and spending a few days there. Here's another view of it. Yeah. It's a little, it's a, it's a little bit, uh, it's not as, as tall as it is there. It's a little lower, a little more humble. But, um, <laughs> but still, it's magnificent. And just to end that part of the story, I would like to just, you, you guys heard about the, the campus in Markham and the campus in India. Well, we have our own little eco-campus in Costa Rica. Uh, it's just developing, and it's also much more modest, but it, it is our little eco-campus. So this is the lot where the Lillian Megan Wright Center will be built. And these three lots have been actually donated to us in the last year to create a small eco-campus. This one here is kind of stuck in the middle, and it belongs to an American couple, uh, and they are willing to sell it. Um, and we made an offer, but they didn't go down, and so uh, we like, you know, when you haggle, you want, okay, we'll make an offer, you go down a little bit. They haven't gone down. But um, we're still, I mean, we're looking for uh, donations for this as well. And uh, so on the other side here is the Las Nubes Forest and the river, flows between us, and this will be our small Las Nubes eco campus. Um, so the possibilities there are also uh, endless and very exciting. That's just another picture of that. Um, and so I'd like to close just with uh, two nice pictures of species that we find there, and sometimes these uh, we don't consider the little lowly amphibians, but um, that's another area that can be explored. Um, and there's room for so many interests of students to, to, um, to join us in the Las Novas project. We might even find some rare species of little dinosaurs, but um, actually that's a flower, right? <laughs> but it looks like uh, something from miniature Jurassic Park. Uh, and so, yeah, Las Nubes, by the way, means the clouds. And so this is, this is actually part of the Las Nubes, and you can understand why it generates these, these uh, little clouds hanging over it. But it's just a lovely area. And so, to, to, to close the, the story, it's important that where the Faculty of Environmental Studies and the Las Novas Project is attempting to uh, find solutions to this problem of 
of conservation and development and well-being and livelihoods, uh, even though it's in just one small section of the world, it is a question that concerns all of us and it's important to, to do something. And so, uh, starting with Woody Fisher and Howard Dougherty who put their little grain of sand into it and has rippled and become uh, uh, this incredible project, um, I'm hoping to add my own uh, grain of sand to this contribution and I think it's an inspiring story to many of students that we have and researchers and I hope that uh, it will also be an inspiration for all of us here to do something as well. Thank you. Thank you.